fathers in the house. Happy Father's Day to the ultimate father, our father. We love you, father. Come on, we're here to worship him this morning and celebrate him for who he is, because he's the Lord of all, Lord of all the earth. Come on, put your hands together with us. I need every hand in the house this morning clapping like this with us.
give him praise this morning. He's worthy of your praise. Hallelujah. Just lift your hands in this place this morning. Put your focus on the Lord this morning and how good he is. No matter what we face, no matter what we go through, he's a good God. He's the best father that we could ever need. Hallelujah, Jesus. We just worship you this morning, God. We give you all the glory and all the praise, God, because you deserve it, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy, God.
close to your side Cause heaven is real And death is a lie I want to hear voices Angels above Singing as one Singing hallelujah Oh
Somebody give God some praise in this house. Warring in the spirit, warring in prayer, breaking through, claiming victory. Can we give God some praise? When you war, you keep pressing on, amen? When you war, you don't give up, amen? Do we have anybody in the house that's gonna keep pressing on regardless of what circumstance and situation looks like? As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, whatever your situation or your need, let's believe God, amen? Is he able to do the miraculous? When it's out of our, our hands and when it's beyond what we can do, is God able, is he faithful? Can he make a way? As we pray this morning, we want to pray for our families and those who have lost loved ones. Erlen Brown lost his mother. Ann Williams lost her mother and Shamar Fonville lost his mother also. Let's claim the victory and lift up the body, amen? As the bodies fitly join together, we are able to overcome by praying and claiming the victory for each other. Whatever your need or situation is today, cry out to the Lord as we pray. And our God is faithful to hear your prayer. Lord, we thank you right now. Lord, we're warring in the spirit. I sense breakthrough. I sense fighting through and pushing through and making a way in the spirit. And Lord, it's when we have an idea and a concept that we're not giving up, but we're putting our faith and trust in you. But Lord, in the process of pressing, is pressing through in the spirit and saying, Lord, have your way in whatever I face, whatever may come my way, whatever I can't see down the road. God, you're big enough to give provision. And Lord, make a way. Lord, we thank you right now. Lord, I build up our families, those that have lost loved ones. Lord, I thank you for, for healing, Holy Spirit, comfort, direct, guide, lead, carry us through whatever comes our way. Lord, we thank you right now for all the provision, for all the glory, for all the power, for all the strength. Lord, it's yours. And if we put our faith and trust in you, then Lord, there's nothing that you can't accomplish or do in the midst of our lives. We believe it today and we'll claim the victory and say yes in Jesus' mighty name. Can you give God some praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, when we were singing that part, there's a war going on, a war in the heavenlies. You know, there's so much going on here on earth. And you know, we all know what happened in South Carolina. And you know what, there's a war going on. Just one more thing that's trying to cause racial divide. But I thank God for a Sheffield home. I thank God for a Sheffield home. Hallelujah. And we're going to sing this chorus one more time. And can we just link hands across the aisles this morning? Can we just link hands? See, this is every Sunday who we are. Not just a one-time thing, but this is who Sheffield is. And you know what? And we're singing about the great I am because he is the great I am. God is the great I am. And even though the enemy tries to come in like a flood and cause division amongst us, we say no because God is the great I am. And he makes the difference in who we are. Hallelujah. Just lift those arms together as we sing one more time. Sing it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy. Almighty. He's the great I am. Who is, Who is worthy? None beside thee. None beside God, thee. Almighty. God Almighty. He's the great I am. am. Sing it hallelujah. hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy. God, God Almighty. The great I am.
Let's give God some praise in this house. He's our protector. He's our vindicator. He's our shield. He's our Lord and Savior. We call his name Jesus. No greater name. When the enemy comes against us, can we say Jesus? When storms rage, we can cry out, Jesus! Ah. When it seems there's no hope, we have hope in Jesus! And we give him all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor that's due his name. Jesus, Jesus, give somebody a hug and tell them I love Jesus today, amen. What about you? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. There's an anointing in this place right now. Amen. 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 Sometimes adversities have to hit us. Amen. For us to learn how to pray. Amen. Through all the social unrest and issues and situations, God is still God. Amen. And I tell you what, he will protect his house. Amen. We'll claim the victory and stand in unison by faith that God is big enough, amen, to do the miraculous in the midst of our lives, amen, amen, amen. We may have to take him on, take him on out and work with him, amen. I need a couple of men, Cedric. Yes, uh, Brother Otis, come on down, work with my brother, help shine, amen. When someone needs prayer and deliverance, we're going to make sure they get the glory. Let's give God some praise for that. Amen. I praise God for this young man, and we're not going to ignore it. Amen. And we might need to help him go on out there to the side to spend some time with him. Amen. For cleansing to happen in the midst of his life. Amen. And family, that's what this, 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 this world, that's what this society, that's what America needs right now is some good old-fashioned deliverance. Amen and truly trusting in a true and living Savior, amen? That's what makes all the difference, amen? That's when lives are changed, amen? When we trust in Jesus and live for him, amen? Let's give God some praise one more time in this place. <laughs> amen. How many happy to be in church today, amen? Oh, that was kind, but I think we can do a little bit better than that. How many are happy to be in the house of God today? Amen. And I must give all of our fathers, those true men who actually take care of their kids, amen, who raise their they babies and show them the right way and give them a good example. Let's give some real love for our true fathers. Amen. If you a fella that hadn't got it together, why don't you get it together today? Amen? Sometimes it's good to go back and just apologize, even to your grown kids. Amen? Get it right so healing can come because that stifles people. You see it all on Facebook and social media. People are stifled by this day. You can pretty much go to any restaurant, especially in the hood, and you don't have no kind of weight. Amen? I know it's real. I know it's getting a little quiet, but that's just real. But the, the, the presence of God bringing restoration to what's been broken, that's the kind of God that he is. Amen? And so we can celebrate. Amen? And see victory. Amen? God is good. And all the time. Our ushers are here.
They have debit envelopes in their possession. If anybody is here in the house and would like to give by means of their debit card, just please raise your hands. They will assist you as quickly as they can. What a blessing to be able to give unto the Lord. We'll be, you can give by any means that you like in a few short moments in service. Amen. But a blessing to have the opportunity to worship our Lord and Savior in giving. Amen. Is there anyone here for the first time? Do we have any first-time guests that are here? Can you please raise your hand? Where's our first-time guest? Amen. Yes, yes. Oh, give them some good love. What a blessing that you decided to come and join us here today. Uh, we're wel we we're welcome you, and please come back as often as you possibly can through these double doors to your left. We have a visitor's reception area. Please stop by there. Someone will greet you and love on you. We have a gift from our pastor that we'd love to bless you with and some refreshments also. So make sure you, before, you, before you leave, all of our first-time guests, that you stop by there. Amen? See what God's purpose and will is for your life. Amen? I have to say there's a wonderful birthday today on this Father's Day. Dr. James Outlaw, amen. 81 years young, amen. Now, Doc, just for about 30 seconds, I need that little dance that you do. I, just for me personally, it's just me. I just need that dance because if you're 81 years old and can give that, that dance like that, I don't know, we got some other musicians on out there. Get, let me get that little dance, Doc, that you do. Yes, sir. I know you're right, Doc. That's, <laughs> that's good. Happy birthday to Dr. Outlaw. Let's give him that love. Amen. That's, <laughs> I ain't going to get you started. That's okay. Thank you for coming out. That's good. Amen. We're going to continue in our announcements. We want to let all of our high school graduates know from 2015 that we want to celebrate you, amen? Amen. Let's give all our high school graduates a hand clap. That's good. Join us on Sunday, June 28th, following the second service in our Koinonia Fellowship Hall. You'll have an opportunity to display your accomplishments as a part of the celebration. You have to sign up in order to participate. Please contact Chris Clay at our church office before Thursday, June 26th, so you can reserve your spot. The married couples are selling Royals tickets for the game against Toronto on July 11th. We're going to Potluck Tailgate, and there's going to be a concert after that game. Tickets are $11, and it includes the concert. For more information, you can pick up a flyer in the lobby or call our church and ask for Sister Mary. The next water baptism is Sunday, June 28th, immediately following the 11 a.m. service. Please call Pat at the office to register and for more information. The shop is open today for food distribution following this service. Please come to our Sheffield West location, 1232 College Avenue, to receive food or assist with the distribution. Amen? And we wanted to let everybody know while we're having our offering, uh, we do have uh, many Bibles that were lost here in the sanctuary. And those that have your names in them or you may not have your name in them, at the end of service, if you go right out here in our lobby to our Welcome Center, you can get your Bible today. If you happen to lose your Bible, you don't know where it is, then please. It'll be listed, the names of those we do have doing offering, but make sure you go and get your Bible. Amen? It's time to give our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Family, we have the opportunity to give and celebrate Jesus today. Amen? What a blessing to be able to give unto him. How many in the house know that tithes are first fruits? Amen? What does first fruit mean? Um, the tithe is the tenth that God has told us to set aside. And, you know, the trials and struggles of life sometimes come, and it's hard sometimes to give God his first fruit. Can I get an amen in the house? Um, it's tough because you lose your job or situations happen, you struggle, and you think, well, Lord, let me take care of all the other bills. Let me keep the lights on, and I'll see if I can give Jesus something when everything else is spent up. And family, when, when adversity hits, does somebody hear me today, is the time that we make sure we give God what's his first. And it's hard when you go through, but God honors that. It's not the amount. 
it's the reality that I intend on giving God what's his. Can I get an amen in the house? I'm going to read today from Philippians, the fourth chapter, the, the, uh, the fourth chapter in the 11th verse. Um, I've learned how to be content in whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, somebody. Whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. He's our hope. He makes a way out of no way. Be faithful unto him, and God will, will manifest miracles in your life, in every area of your life. That will blow your mind. Can we bow our heads together in prayer? Lord, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be obedient to your word. Lord, we thank you for your power, your strength, your anointing. We bless this tithe right now. Stir the hearts of your people, even those that may be watching online. Lord, that they can give at this moment and time and be blessed. Lord, we thank you for the victory right now. We give you all praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray everyone said together. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Thank you, band. It's it's my understanding. It's my understanding that we have a we have a family with us today from Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Cynthia Tucker and her family are are you here? Are you here? We would love to, if you would allow us, we would love to, to pray for you in, uh, in conjunction with praying for your church. This uh, tragedy that happened, you can, you can spin it politically any way you want. Cynthia, please come down and join us. Maybe somebody walk with her there, help her, lead her down here, one of our home folks. And if you have family here, please bring them with you. A tra this tragedy that happened, you can spin it any way you want politically, and people are doing that. But uh, it, it's hate, and it's racism, and it's, it's, it's nothing more than that. And Sheffield, we represent, we are so honored to have you here today. Let me come down there. Uh, break, it just breaks all of our hearts when this, something like this happens. And I ask you, you know, look around today. I wish, I wish everybody in the United States could see, see this picture. You know, it's a, it's a summer crowd. We have a lot of holes in the crowd today, but we still look the same. We look the same. And I urge you, I, I push you, implore you, every chance you get, to represent the love of God over hate and racism and ignorance that propitiates that. Please stand verbally in opposition to it. I mean, you can stand now, but stand in opposition. Stand in opposition to the racism because people make ignorant comments, and I mean pure ignorance. Most you know, racism is you put a bunch of three-year-olds together, and they don't hate each other because of the color of their skin. Racism is taught and it's learned. Racism is planted and grown in people. And I hate it. I hate it. And it goes every direction. And I, and I hate racism and I think it's okay to, to hate racism. It's okay to hate that. And every chance I get, because some of the circles I, I have to move in, even among God's people, sometimes you get comments and you get jokes that people think are funny, and they're not funny. And I tell them, you don't know where I'm from. Otherwise, you wouldn't be saying that. Sometimes I feel like Steve Martin in the movie The Jerk. They just don't know it. So today, we're going to pray for your church. We're going to pray for your church. And we are so sorry for the hate and the crime and the evil that has fallen in South Carolina on this house of God. We're going to pray for life and we're going to pray for love. And we're going to pray for somehow unity and understanding and education to go beyond the ignorance and the hate and the disdain and loathsome acts of people. Because not everybody is like that. Not everybody hates people because of the color of their skin or the culture or the class of people that somebody is or whether they have money or don't have money, where they live, where they stand, where they work. There's hate based on so many things, but not everybody's like that. God has called us to love in spite of barriers. And you know what? Somebody loved me, so it's pretty easy for me to love. And you love me, and you allow me to be your pastor and I've said it before, I've said it before, those of you who are African American or Hispanic, Latino in this crowd, thank you for allowing a Caucasian man, an Anglo man, I hate that word, but thank you for allowing a Caucasian man to speak into your life and to be connected to you and be partnered with you. Thank you for allowing me that opportunity. I don't take it for granted. Every day I live, I love the fact that you love me and you allow me to be your brother. I love that. 
And I was thinking it was with Father's Day, I think the greatest gift I've ever given my children is bringing them to Kansas City and allowing them to be a part of Sheffield Family Life Center and this community and see what the world is really supposed to be like. <laughs> Cynthia, let's, uh, let's agree in prayer. Let's call out on the name of the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Heavenly Father, we can't control everything everyone does, but we can control what we do. So God, I pray that you would fill our mouths and fill our hearts with life and love. God, let us be people who are willing to educate, willing to sometimes even understand the ignorance of people and educate them. God, I pray that you would give us opportunity to represent the love of Christ, which supersedes any other thing. Your name is above every name. The love of Christ is above every other thing. It is above every other power on earth. And God, I pray for Cynthia as she represent her church today to us. God, I pray that you would bring healing to that body, bring healing to that community. And don't let the acts of one person that are destructive tear down, but let them continue to forgive as they miraculously already have, which astounds me only by the grace of God. We thank you for that, Lord. Bless them. Bless this congregation. Bless Bless Charleston. Bless this community. God, I pray that you would bless the African-American community in Charleston. Let, the, let the, uh, the blessing of God fall on this community. Show your hand. Let it be seen and obvious. And God, I pray that you would do miracles and signs and wonders and heal in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What an amazing opportunity. Thank you for allowing us to pray with you, Cynthia. And thank you for loving us. I would love to have a Kleenex. There's one right here. You'll have to excuse me. Cause, you know, when you, ha you have that feeling that something wrong is about to turn loose. And you really don't want that to happen. We have Freedom Sunday coming up on Jan uh, July 12th. Sunday, July 12th. And Freedom Sunday is, is an amazing chance for us as a congregation. I've just recently had a couple people come to me with testimonies saying everything I listed on my Freedom Sunday request happened. And I, I get that every year. And I can, I can promise you this because God has done it for eight years. On Freedom Sunday, miraculous things happen in people's lives. Because we have a concerted effort, we're focused, there is power in agreement. And so when we agree on that one thing, and not just one request, but one focus, God does something special. It happens every year. Miracles happen. It doesn't happen for everybody, but it happens for somebody. And it could be you. It could be you because it's happened for many people. And that day we have you turn in freedom requests. We pray over everybody who wants to be prayed for, laying on of hands and praying by the, by the leaders and elders, pastors uh, of the church. And it's, it's an awesome time. And then we, uh, we ask you to give a special offering that is just a, a sacrificial gift to God. And that money goes into ministry. It goes into uh, upgrades and doing ministry and missions and all kinds of projects. This year, and the theme is, is simply freedom. The, the theme is simply freedom this year. I always have a theme, and that seemed too simple, but I keep landing on it. So uh, there are so many facets of that, but the, the theme is freedom. And we have, we have a, uh, something we need to focus on this year. You know, and I cast vision back in January and told you about what I, I felt like God spoke to me about the buildings, the ministry that was supposed, supposed to take place on this street, 
from the corner, which was the shop, to the Wade's building and buildings in between and what's supposed to happen. And you have caught that vision and you have prayed about it. And we have been in communication with, with the owners and uh, property managers and different people. We have, we have sought, we have prayed. People have walked around the property. I've walked around the property. Pastors, elders have walked around the property. We have focused on this. We've had dialogue and God just kept telling me along the way, and we had a chance a couple of weeks ago to actually make an offer, and God just kept telling me, this is not the way it's going to happen. And, and that's been a struggle for me, because, you know, we want to get our hand in the game. We think, well, we can make an offer, maybe that's how it's going to happen, and God just kept saying, that's not the way it's going to happen. And I thought, well, so I started, I started trying to work it a little bit in my brain. Okay, well, Freedom Sunday's coming up. It's just specifically talking about the former Wade's building. Freedom Sunday's coming up. Maybe we can do that in conjunction. And then God, because I, I want to, you know, I spoke vision to you. I want you to see action from that. I want to control it. I want to say, okay, we spoke it into existence. We have had faith, and now God has done this, and look how beautiful it is. Well, I believe that's going to happen, but it's not going to happen in a way that we can manufacture unfortunately. And so we have a need in-house. I, I told you probably six, seven weeks ago, six or seven weeks ago, we have a major, major problem with our sound system in the auditorium. Uh, we had two Sundays, one Sunday when we had no sound. Some of you will remember that. We only had monitors because they run from a different board, different system, so to speak, uh, which is not good, but it was good that one day. And so we were able to flip the monitors around. We had no system. The next Sunday, it powered up literally minutes before the 9 o'clock service started. And we know we have a faulty system. It's, it was uh, designed in 1997, so it is, it is 17 years old. And technology advances. And most of our equipment, they don't even use anymore because it has advanced so much. And we've just been praying, God, give it extra life. Give it extra life. And I believe in that, and I believe God has done that. For probably 10 years, people have been telling me the system's going to crash. It's going to crash. And I do know we've had experts in here to look at it, several companies and uh, sound people and our own people. They know that at some point it's going to be done and it's never going to power up again. And I thought, well, I don't, that's not fun. It's like a car repair. We put money into something so we can keep doing exactly what we've been doing. Nothing changes. That's not really what I want to see happen. And we're talking, brace yourselves, we're talking about a $100,000 venture. Because everything has to be replaced except the speakers up above us. Thank God. But everything has to be replaced. And so, thinking I don't really want to do that, but I felt compelled and I, I took it to the... I guess it's a little awkward, but <laughs> and so 17 years later, 17 years later, we're looking at a brontosaurus. <laughs> so it's uh. And, and the only reason I would allow somebody to do that is because I know James. I have a relationship with James, and he works with us. Uh, most of the time, that's not going to happen randomly. <laughs> Just FYI. <laughs> but um, I'm thinking, I, I really don't want to do that. That's a $100,000 venture. That's a lot of money. Uh, I can't write that check. I doubt if too many of you can. But collectively, collectively something, and, and God showed me something, because I was, I was debating God. Do you ever debate God? You just kind of try to bring him to your side, like you do co-workers and family members. You just kind of, you just kind of present your side, and maybe God will move your way. Well, I was, I was praying about Freedom Sunday and the sound system, and this is what God gave me, literally. This is what God gave me. I kid you not, I'm not making it up, I'm not stretching it. 
though I will in a minute. If the cabin loses air pressure, if the cabin loses air pressure, an oxygen mask will drop out, will drop down. Take the mask, place it over your nose and mouth. And then, and I always watch for this. This is one of the few moments of instruction that I actually enjoy when the flight attendant does this with this elastic band. They don't actually touch it to their head. They just kind of put it there and act like they're going to. So I watch that. So place it over your nose and mouth, put the elastic band around your head, and pull it tight with these little teeny strap things. And then they say, if you have small children or someone needing assistance, what do you do? You put yours on first. Put your mask on first. Now, we have some flight attendants here. Is that correct, Michael? Is that correct? We have two of them right there on either side, like an exit door. <laughs> Michael and Angie Arter right there, and their daughter's going. So, and actually, this, Michael got us this. But this is what I saw. This is the vision God gave me. And it was, it was exactly that. Put the oxygen mask on yourself first so you're able to assist those who need help. God said, you have to keep the house healthy. You have to fix the house first. And then you can do what you need to do in the community. And that is, that is a principle. That is true. Because if we don't pay our bills here, if we don't keep the lights on, if we don't have sound, because everything that, everything that happens out of Sheffield begins right here on Sunday. All the ministry, the feeding, the clothing, children's ministries down the hall, which they're doing incredible stuff today. Exit that way if you can to see what they're doing. It's amazing for Father's Day. The feeding programs, the things we do, the way we minister to the community, prayer we have, hospital visitation, everything that happens flows out of Sunday morning. It flows out of this. This is the centerpiece of everything that happens at Sheffield. So if we don't pay the light bills, if we don't pay the water bills, if we don't have sound, if we don't have what we need in the house, we are not able to do what we need to do outside of the house. So because of that, I am not ashamed to come to you and say, this is something we have to do in the house. This is putting an oxygen mask on first so we can help those who need further assistance. And you'll be getting this presented to you the next three Sundays. You'll get a letter if you're on our mailing list. And here's what I believe, because we're talking a lot of money, $100,000, but here's what I know. The miracle is in the house. It always is. The miracle is always in the house. I have no doubt, I have no doubt that we can do everything we need to do, we can get done everything we need to get done, and God will bless it because of it. So I ask you this, begin to pray about what God wants you to do. It's as simple as that. Begin to pray about what God wants you to do as part of this. It's going to be a normal Freedom Sunday offering, and we will give some of it to missions, and we will do little pieces that we have to do because I think it's only right for the kingdom of God and for holistic ministry, but the bulk of what we're giving is going to go to fix the sound system in this building, in this house right here. And I appreciate your support on that because you're getting what I'm saying, the we moved in here, you moved in here, I wasn't here then, you moved here in, in 2000, in the year 2000, and not much other than some decor and, and some, some lighting changes, not much has been done in this room and for this specific building. So it's time we have to do something. So I know, I know God's going to speak to you, and I know the miracle's in the house, and uh, I'm happy to give that to you because when we follow the direction of God, he blesses us. It's as simple as that. I'm going to give you a uh, couple of quick things for Father's Day here, and uh, ladies, I'm going to direct a lot of things to the men, but they apply to you. Many of the things apply to you, and I will, I will spread those things out a little bit as well. 
And I'm, I'm not one for jokes. Usually I see humor in daily function in normal life. I don't tell a lot of jokes. I usually don't remember jokes. I only remember a couple of them because there aren't that many that I actually think are funny. But uh, a father was, uh, they, was sitting at the dinner table. They were eating, he was eating with, uh, with, his, with his family and his son, Michael, who's about kindergarten age, asked him, said, Dad, do bugs really taste good? And the dad said, Michael, you know, we, we can talk about that later. And he said, no, Dad, I, I need to know. Do bugs really taste good? And he said, Michael, you know how, how you get, you've got to get the stern, the stern look. Michael, we'll talk about that later. We're not going to talk about that at the dinner table. So later on, a couple hours later, uh, Dad remembered. He said, oh, hey, Mike, what, what was it you were wanting to know about bugs now? And he said, well, it really doesn't matter now. I was asking you because there was a giant bug in your mashed potatoes. <laughs> That's a dad for you. Do not say that now. Let me eat the bug. I heard, uh, I heard a story about a man who was down, he was down in the panhandle. He was on a beach. Uh, on a trip, went to the beach down in the panhandle of Florida. He was in a spot where he was basically alone. And he was walking along the beach, and he saw what, what looked to be an Aladdin's lamp. It looked just like what he had seen in the movies and kind of half buried. And he, he picked that up and looked at it, and then he started thinking, you know, there's somebody setting me up here. So he was looking around, looking for TV cameras and looking around, and there was nobody there. And so he had this lamp in his hand that, was just like what he had always seen. And he thought, well, that'd be crazy not to try it. So he put his hand on it and kind of rubbed it a little bit, and, and a genie appeared. And it looked pretty similar to the cartoons and, and movie genies, and, and there, there it was. And I said, I'm going to give you three wishes. He thought, really? Yeah. So he said, well, okay, well, I want to be the strongest man in the world. That's a pretty vain male answer. I want to be the strongest man in the world. And he said, okay. And so he, he saw this huge rock, this huge boulder over there, half in the water, half on the sand, went over there, picked it up like it was nothing. It was amazing. And he said, hey, Jeannie, I want a really, really expensive car. And there was a road not too far right at the top of the beach, and he looked up there, and suddenly there was a red Lamborghini there, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. There was a red Lamborghini up, and he said, this is incredible. I need to, to set myself up right here. He said, okay, Jeannie, my last wish, I want to be the smartest person in the world. And he immediately became a woman. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Dads, <laughs> three things to keep in mind as a father, and, and I'm, I'm going to give you several more things, but I think we're really called to a number of things as dads, and, and, I, and I understand. I understand today, today is probably... Father's Day is, the, is the, probably the most divided holiday in our country because it represents hurt and pain and loss and what hasn't happened well for so many people. And uh, separation, um, betrayal, it represents a lot, of, a lot of bad things, and it also represents some great things. And so I think in terms of, you know, a fatherhood, and, and, and I, I tell you not to sound cliche-esque, but... You know, God becomes that heavenly father for us. God speaks into our life like maybe you wish your father would have or, or did. And God gives us that, that health that we need because of the broken fatherless pieces that are in us. And everybody here has a father issue on some level because nobody's perfect. And, you know, I've had a great dad, but I've got my issues with my dad. And he's an incredible father. And so I'm sure everybody like me has, you've got an issue 
whether they've been there, not been there. And Father's Day is a tough day for a lot of people. But we celebrate what is designed to be, and in many cases is, a wonderful, wonderful thing. So dads, we're called to provide to the best of your ability. Don't get caught up comparing what you provide to somebody else. That's not what it's about. Uh, you know, when, when we were young, when I was a child, we didn't have any money. We were pretty poor. I didn't know it. You know, I didn't know. I didn't realize that the reason my mom put patches on all my pants is because we didn't have any money to buy more pants. And she'd put a patch on top of a patch on top of a patch. I've told you that story. And a lot of you, like me, you probably grew up and, and didn't have a lot of money, but you had some of the stuff that you really wanted, with, which made you feel like you had a lot of money, and you don't know any difference. So we don't, we don't compare ourselves to other people. That's not provision. Provision is doing the best you can to provide for the people around you that you're responsible for. So provide, protect, and promote. Guard everyone, guard their feelings, guard their lives, and promote, build them up. Dads, nobody, nobody has the voice in the American culture and in the world that, that, a, that a male does to speak life. There's something there, and that's not to, to say anything that's unequitable, because I'm all for equity. If a woman does the same job as a man, she should get the same pay, maybe more, because they are the smarter species. That was a great opportunity, ladies. So I'm all for equity and all for that. This is not a chauvinistic deal. Uh, a lot of times a woman's opinion will, will, be, will resonate and make more sense than a man's. And I, I get that. And sometimes the other way around. But men, you have a voice that is unmatched. And when you promote people, when you promote people around you, it does something that nothing else in society can do. And fathers, as much as you try, you'll miss it sometimes. You know, my, probably, the thing that's changed me more in life than any other thing was being a father. When my, when my first child, who's Gio, uh, who now lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota, when he was born, um, and it changed my life like nothing ever had. It just, it changes your heart. It changes your heart, and it did me. And nothing has been, nothing has been like fatherhood. Nothing's like fatherhood, but we still fail. 1 Samuel chapter 16 is really about the choices of a father and the decision of a father that's pointed out in the first half of chapter 16. It's a story that I have read to you many times because there are several great sermons here, and one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is in this collection in 1 Samuel chapter 16, Samuel was the prophet of God, and, and he was responsible for hearing God's voice and passing that on to leadership, specifically the king, and he would anoint in and out of the temple, and for the king and for others as well. Samuel, the prophet, was told by God, find a man named Jesse. I've selected one of his sons to be the next king, to be my king, the king of Israel, Saul, the anointing had been removed from him. He had walked out from his anointing, and God was telling Samuel, his mouthpiece, his prophet, that I have a new king. He's in the household of Jesse. It's one of his sons, and you need to go find him and anoint him king. Samuel said, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will have me killed. Because even though he was the prophet and the voice of God, the king still had control over what he was able to do. So God gave him this, this plan. Take a cow, take a heifer with you, and say that you have come, which was true, it was not a lie, he was going to sacrifice, either way. So say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord, invite Jesse to the sacrifice. Notice he's, he's talking about the father, he doesn't, he's not mentioning the sons specifically by name, because in that culture, everything flowed through the father. Everything in the household, everything in the city, everything in, in, direction, in the direction of the society flowed through the father, flowed through the man of the house. And that's a little different culture than we have, but that's the way it worked there. So he said, take it, invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So he invited them to the sacrifice when they all arrived. 
Samuel took one look at his oldest son, Eliab, and he thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And history says that Eliab was tall, he was handsome, he looked kingly. So it's like, okay, he must be the one. But the Lord said to Samuel, and this is, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Beautiful. So all seven who were invited, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel one by one. Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? And you know the story, probably. They're still the youngest. He wasn't even worth inviting. They're still the youngest, but he's out in the fields. He's working. We didn't think he needed to be here. He's the youngest. He is irrelevant in the, in the family line right now. He's out watching sheep and goats. And Samuel said, send for him at once. We will not sit down until he arrives. And as soon as David walked in from the field, the Lord said to Samuel, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, and, and think about the picture, he's standing there among all, all of his brothers who are older and more prominent than him. Samuel took the flask of oil and anointed David with the oil, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and from that day on, the anointing was on him, and then Samuel returned to Ramah. Jesse didn't see. He was, he was the father. He was probably a good father, a wise father. Obviously, he was open to the voice and direction of God for Samuel to speak to him and that to happen with his sons. But Jesse didn't see the hand of God before the anointing. You know, I, I, have, I have bounced things off of my dad, who's a godly man over the years, and things that I knew God was speaking to me. And there have been a time or two when he said, you can't do that. And I would look at him and say, I have to, because that's what God's speaking to me. You can't. You know, so the, so the man who gives me counsel and, you know, was so much wiser than me, say, you can't do that. And I look at him and say, I have to. I have no choice, because that's what God has spoken to me. Samuel told Jesse, it's one of your sons, and he missed it. He didn't see it. He brought the other seven, and it ended up being the eighth one. So Samuel missed that. But one of the things he did do that I'm greatly impressed with, and I think it was, it was a huge growth God discipleship move, and we're still on the discipleship track, because between three months and two years following this anointing, we don't know the exact time frame David was anointed as king, and somewhere between three months, he was about 15 years old. He was 15 years old when he was anointed king. So here's this 15-year-old guy being told, you're going to be the king of Israel. And he was anointed that by the prophet, by the man of God. Somewhere after that, between three months and two years, between when he was 15 and 17, he ended up fighting Goliath. You can find, you know, debate on the time frame when that happened, but it was following this, and it was sometime between 15 and 17, three months and two years following the anointing. Now, when, when David was sent to go visit his brothers, and he ended up fighting Goliath, where was he? He was in the field. He was sent from the field after being anointed king. So David had been anointed the king of Israel by the man of God and had to go back in the field and watch sheep and goats. And you can blame that on his dad. That's incredible wisdom. Because things happen in the field that don't happen in the palace. A couple things to tell you about the field, and it's about discipleship. Number one, we learn in the field. We learn discipleship in the field. We grow in the field. We go through things in the field. We experience life and God in the field, and in the field is where our faith grows. You know, when, when David was, was, at the, was in the valley of Elah, where Goliath was, was, was spewing his, his words to the, to the Israelite army and to the king, David's plea was, I was watching my father's sheep, and a lion attacked. 
and I killed the lion. And I was watching my father's sheep and a bear attacked and I killed the bear. Now if God gave me the lion and the bear, he will deliver this giant into my hands as well. Where did he learn that? In the field. In the field. We learn in the field. We learn out there doing it, doing the ugly daily work. Our journey gives us life and faith and hope in the field. And because David had seen the hand of God move in the field with the sheep and goats, he knew that God's hand could move. And he walked out there with no doubt, God will deliver this giant into my hands the way he did the enemies in the field. Because of what happened, he wasn't afraid of the daunting giant, the daunting enemy that stood before him. Now, the field can be tough because not only do we learn in the field, we get lost in the field. Time lapses. Well, God spoke this to me. I felt like God impressed this. You may have a Sunday, like a couple of Sundays ago, we prayed over several things, and it was amazing. There was power three Sundays ago, I believe, in, the, in this altar area. It was incredible. That happens sometimes where people get specific calls. You respond. Maybe God speaks something to you at that point, and then you have to go back to the field. You know, one of the, one of the real struggles of life is going back into reality. After you take a vacation... After you take a few days off, you even have a long weekend, walking back in that office or that place of work, you just go, oh, man, I don't even want to be here. Reality. Reality's tough. That's the field. And it's that way spiritually, too. God is not always zapping us with lightning bolts of anointing. We get that call, we get that empowerment, we get that, that feel from God, we get that understanding, we get that move. It happens, and then time passes, and we're in the field, and we have to live it out. Yeah, but God, you told me, guys, men, you told me I was going to be a man of faith and power. I was going to preach your word. I was going to witness. I was going to do this. You were going to give me this opportunity. You were going to give me this ministry. You were going to do this. You were going to bless me with finances and favor. And, and then you end up in the field, and it seems like nothing's happening. That's the field. The field is where we have to live every day. The Valley of Elah, that's where the giant is defeated. The field is where we gain the faith to do it. The field is where we learn God. The field is where we understand how God moves and how true he really is. We can get lost in that field. We get frustrated. We get tired. We get confused. We get hurt. And men in the American culture, it's not okay for men to say they're hurt and they're tired and they're frustrated. I know you can't say amen. You have people sitting around you. When's the last time a man came up to you and just said, I am just so hurt. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I don't know what to do. I just, I'm, just, I'm just hurt. As men, we can't do that. Not in the United States. Not in Kansas City. How you do it? You can be getting the beating of your life, and you'll say, oh, man, no, it's good. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, yeah man, it's good. It's good. Cool. All right, all right. Stay out of trouble. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you walk away and go, no, it's not good. It's terrible. And I'm about dead. You ever feel like you're hanging by a thread and you can't tell anybody? You're about to fall over the edge and you can't tell anybody because everybody's depending on you? Carrying the weight of your household, whether you're a man or a woman, a father, a mother, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, a cousin, carrying the weight gets heavy, and that's the field. And you work, and you work, and you provide, and you do, and you show up, and you think, is there any value in this at all? Does anybody appreciate anything that's happening? You cook meals, and nobody even cares. And you've been working all day and all night. You pay everybody's way, nobody seems to care because that's expected. Let's, let's get honest. 
It's tough in the field. And who can you tell? Who can you tell? You can't tell anybody, especially men, because you're not allowed to show that kind of emotion, that kind of weakness. We get lost in the field. I'm out there wandering, hanging by a thread. Nobody knows it, and I have to put on the face. Men, women, that's a tough place in the field. We begin to feel irrelevant. You ever feel irrelevant like you just don't even matter? That's a horrible feeling. And God begins to try to speak volume to you and value to you, and, and you, don't even, you don't even receive it. No, God, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Stop telling me that, God. Stop telling me you love me because you really don't. Nobody does. You can't. And I can, I can tell a lot of times when men are feeling that way, they won't tell you they are, but they'll start telling stories of their past and lying. When men are feeling ir- irrelevant and, and without value, they will start telling you how great they used to be. Sit around, and men know this. We all know this about each other. I'm not going to tell any of our real secrets. But we know this about each other. Guys will sit around predominantly and talk about what a great athlete they used to be. Oh, yeah, back in the day. It's always back in the day. Which day was it? It doesn't matter. It's the day. Back in the day, all the schools were looking at me. Yeah, hoping you wouldn't show up. You know, I was, if it wouldn't have been for the bum knee, I was going Big 12, dog. You know, I got that, I got that bum knee. Now, it, ah, yeah, it still kind of hurts. That's why I quit playing ball. I might I have been in the league. You bumped it on a couch in the middle of the night. That's not a sports injury. That is not a sports injury. Start talking about how great they are. And, and, and men, we know this. I'm going to tell one of our slight secrets. It's not anybody here. It's other guys that we know. Men start talking about how many women actually want them. You know the deal. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> they, they all, they're, all, they're all after me. I, I can't eat, you know. I'm, and I'm just thinking, you must be really rich. Because I'm not seeing it. <laughs> you must have a lot of money. <laughs> but that, that's, that's, that's us. That's guys. How they want to tell you how drunk they got, how much beer they drank, how many women are after them, and what a great athlete we used to be. That's us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know why, men, you know why people do that? Because they feel irrelevant and valueless living in the field. So I'm going to tell you that I do have some value and try to convince you of my value because I don't feel like I have any. And I'll make some, I'll make some stuff up if I need to just to give me some perceived value. We get lost in the field, and men, we're guilty of it because we need things, and we can't say we need them. We need significance. Dads, you need significance. Men, you need significance. We need to know that we matter. Somewhere, somehow, we need to know that we matter. And we make horrible decisions because we want to be significant. We need success. We need to feel like we're good at something. We're good at something. And you know, all of these things I'm talking about, God has a way of embracing us and erasing all the hurt in moments. And so it's an amazing thing to finally give in to God and allow God to heal the wounds that are inside of you that nobody can see. We need significance, we need success, and we need someone to believe in us. You need someone to believe in you. We all need that. You've heard of stop, drop, and roll. You've heard of stop, drop, and roll. Well, I've got, I've got one. And men, men, we do this. Women don't do this a whole lot. Help me out. Now, men, women, this isn't you, but this is us. You see each other, and you go... Yeah. 
stop, drop, and stop, drop, and roll. I call it slap, dap, and go. <laughs> slap, dap, and go because we need that. My world can be horrible, but if I can give me a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and all right, I said, all right, man, all right, take it easy, all right? All right, that's slap, dap, and go. We need it. We need encouragement. And I'll do that with 10 different guys in 10 minutes. I'm a slap, dap, and roll player. So we'll do that. And we'll go like that. And I need some, Rayvon, I need another one. One's not enough. I got to give me some slap, dap, and go. All right, all right, all right, player. Now let's just go. All right. All right. That's what we need. Because we need to be built up. Men, we act like we are so tough and we are so weak and fragile. It's ridiculous. And we can do that. I can be in a horrible mood and I can give me some slap, dap, and go. And I literally will walk different walking away from you. No, no, no. Give it to me for real. Thank you. And, and past, I love doing this with Pastor Ray. Pastor, Pastor Ray, Pastor Ray will give, Pastor Ray will give you the real deal. He give you the real, and, he, and he'll give you that. Give you a chest, boom. boom. <laughs> he'll give you that chest bump because you want to feel it. You know what I'm saying? Come on, Michael, get up and give me some. You want to feel it? That's right. You want to feel it. That's my slap, dap, and roll. Go. But you know what happens? We die in the field because we're alone. Because we choose to be alone. We choose to be separate and we choose to be alone. And the enemy picks us off and picks our brain while we're in the field. And rather than feeling like we matter, he begins to tell us you don't matter. You don't matter. You know what? You've got nothing. Because we men, we like to act like we've got it all going on. Always. Always. Got it going on. We'll walk. We'll talk. we got the language. we got the slap, dap, and go. we got it all. And we walk away, and the enemy tells us, ladies, this is one, another one of our male secrets. The enemy tells us, you're a fake and you got nothing. Now, don't support that. That does not help the cause. The enemy does. Men, am I telling the truth? And you can't make enough money. You can't have enough stuff. You can't have enough friends. You can't drink enough. You can't have enough sex. You can't do enough anything to get that out of your heart. Because the enemy comes in and says, you are worthless. And everybody knows it's a game. What's the answer? It's simple, but probably not exactly what you're expecting me to say. The answer is, we have to allow God to minister to us. We have to open ourselves up to God. We have to open ourselves up to God. Men, the key, and women, this is for you too. You don't deal with exactly the same psyche we do, but everybody has the same similar you know, issues, problems. We all have value battles in our mind. We all do. The enemy will tell all of us, male, female, you're, you're worthless. You don't mean anything. You're not going to be anything. We have to open ourselves up to God and allow God to do in us what he really wants to do. And eventually, eventually God gets us to the place where we realize, you know what, I do have value. I lived a lot of my life feeling like I didn't, but I do have value. Because I have a God who really loves me in spite of myself. (laughs) 
And I don't have that many friends, but I've got a few friends who really love me. And God has blessed me. God has blessed me. It's Father's Day. God has blessed I wouldn't choose any other child for the three that I've got. I wouldn't trade any of them for anything. They're all better than me. They're all better than me. We have to open ourselves up and allow God to minister to us. And men, it's tough. It's tough because we're supposed to be a certain thing and walk a certain way and you know, and, and so many things are equated with weakness, worshiping and doing things. You know, you, the, the enemy plays so many tricks on our mind. And, but if we can open ourselves up to God and say, okay, God, go ahead and do in me what you want to do. I'm in the field and it's kind of rough, but go ahead and do in me what you want to do. Speak what you need to speak to me because I'm listening. One of the great parts of the field is we have opportunity to listen if we're willing to do it. Listen while you can. Let God speak to you. Let God build you up. Let God give you value. It takes, it takes most of us. It took me years and years and years and years in the spiritual journey to realize that God really loved me. Because, you know, all I see, when I see myself, all I see is my faults. You know, when I look at myself, all I see is the bad. I'm telling you, this is the honest, it's deep, dirty, dirty honest. When I look at myself, all I see is the bad. And I struggle with that. And God has had to, had to speak to me and show me my value. You know, I don't like to look at pictures of myself because I see the bad stuff. I don't like to take pictures. Those of you who know me know that. I don't like pictures because I don't want to see it. And I struggle with that because what I see is bad. And the enemy has just taken me down so many roads because of that. But God somehow helps you realize that there's good in you and you have value. And you mean something to him. And maybe when somebody says they care about you, they actually do. That's another hard one. Maybe they actually do. We have to be willing to receive love. You have to open the door and be willing to receive love, and that's not easy. Because you get hurt in the field, you get hurt, you get abused, you get taken advantage of, you get walked on, you get betrayed. All that happens in the field. But God can take us through that. And men, before you walk out this door, and it's, it's late again, before you walk out this door and finish the rest of your Father's Day, and ladies, thank you for allowing me to direct a lot toward the men today. Thank you for your grace in that. But uh, um, men, before you walk out this door, I'm going to ask you to, to pray with me. And ladies, join us in this if you want to. Stand with me if you would, please, all over the auditorium. And it's going to be a simple prayer, just, to, just an open heart, just an open heart toward God. It's going to be a simple prayer of an open heart toward God. Pray this with me if you need to today. Heavenly Father, you are my Heavenly Father, and you love me. I open my heart to you today. I receive your love, and I ask you to change my heart, change my mind, change my direction, create in me a heart that can receive love from you. I surrender myself to you today. I am a man or woman of God, whichever you are. I am a man of God, and I stand on that today. I know who I am. You love me. You give me favor. And I love you because of that. Thank you for life. Thank you for love. 
direct my paths. In Jesus' name, amen. Those were a lot of little pieces thrown together. But God is able. Thank you for being with us today. Next week we'll be back on discipleship again, a little, a little closer track on discipleship. Have a great Father's Day. Have a great week. Be safe. Pray for, uh, pray for the, the South Carolina church body and what we're dealing with in our country. God bless you.